The time is now 9 o'clock. Ms. Garcia is going to be a couple minutes behind, so we'll go ahead and call this academic committee meeting to order. Uh, first on the agenda, items for discussion. Curriculum advisor role, Ms. Stacia Stewart. Good morning. Happy November, everybody. I'm so excited to share uh, the work of uh, our curriculum advisors and kind of speak to that piece. Um, I did pass out a little uh, infographic there, and I'm going to be leading with this. Um, I'm not going to be reading it like verbatim, but I just wanted you to be aware of the um, impact of the two ladies sitting here. Um, at the district level, uh, we are very, very blessed. We have a great team of individuals on our academic service team here, um, my mentors, and then um, our teacher leaders and our curriculum advisor. Um, I call them impact coaches. They are really <coughs> the impact in classroom practices. And so um, down at the bottom, because our district focuses on people first, we're going to focus on these individuals. Um, these individuals you'll see are outlined um, in territories, um, and that was our reorganization this year. Um, we were, as I was in this role the last two years, we were housed here at Noise. Um, in my first year, we were housed at TMC. We know the real work happens in the classroom. We know the real work happens in the schools. And so um, our curriculum advisor team got together. We built a plan that we felt was going to be successful um, in our two main goals. And so our two main goals are really, and we can probably repeat them because we uh, state them all the time, but we're positively impacting the narrative. We radiate positivity. We support our teachers. That's our first goal. The second goal is really that if we're leading in high-performing spirits, the results will come. So those are the main two goals. We, we really work to positively impact that narrative, um, but also work extremely hard to impact students. Uh -huh. um, and so you'll uh, you'll see the outline there. There are um, there's an elementary building that houses um, three curriculum advisors. There's a middle school that houses three curriculum advisors, and then there's a high school that houses three curriculum advisors. One of the key components for the curriculum advisors when we built the plan said they honored the hallmark of collaboration. They know that they go out and do um, individual work in individual buildings, but they needed a place to come back to, to have professional conversations, discussions around. Um, and so we wanted to keep that piece. That was a piece that was very important to them. Um, it's tough work um, to lead as a curriculum advisor and really impact um, uh, student learning. And so um, we wanted them to feel valued and that there was a support team around them. Um, and so the three schools that house the curriculum advisors are Mark Twain. There's a, a, um, a space back there. Um, and then we have Ruby New Middle School for our middle school. And then we also have Benton High School. So in the three areas of town um, in that piece. Um, we have two curriculum advisors that um, have very uh, unique gifts. Um, Bob Nash, Mr. Bob Nash, um, works primarily with Virtual Academy and the uh, building up of that program. Um, he is now down at Benton. There are uh, many teachers down at Benton teaching a blended model where they teach um, some time um, online and then some time in, in person. Um, and so that was just a great fit for him there. Um, and honoring the collaboration aspect of working with three other curriculum advisors for that support as well. And then Janelle Becerra. Janelle Becerra really leads up the fine arts uh, curriculum strength role there. And so um, she kind of encompasses all new teachers onboarding in the areas of fine arts. And so her office space, you'll find her at Mark Twain, but um, she's all over the district. <clears throat> so those are my people, those are our people, those are our teachers' people, those are our team. Um, and they do some um, really great work. Um, we, there, as a leader, you know you lead with some critical first, and those were the three um, items up top there, the St. Joseph School District Convocation, engage in your own learning, and then the clarity for learning and the 3D educator piece. Those are the district uh, focus or initiative pieces that we lead with. Um, <clears throat> those critical first really um, 
I believe in the power of moments, and these moments can create movements. And that's really what those pieces did, um, the convocation and the engage. And you will see um, the data there that represents the survey results from teachers, so that um, in the convocation, um, the communications department was also about sharing those results, but 73.4% agreed or strongly agreed that the convocation was worthwhile and enjoyable. That's a high number. And then engage in your own learning. We hosted 180 learning sessions out to the campus of Missouri Western. Um, there were 30 sessions offered each hour for six hours. And 87.9% rated the um, variety of learning as highly engaging or engaging. Again, another moment piece for our district. Um, do we know as a team that we have things to get better on? Yes. And we've already reflected on those things that we want to improve in those um, pieces. Um, but they are, they are, they will be and are our movement pieces. We have another piece coming up November 11. That'll be a professional learning piece. Uh, we are meeting in the 3D educator that morning. Uh, we were very strategic in the planning with the academic team. Uh, I, I can't thank Dr. McGinnis, Mrs. Clark, um, uh, Dr. Gilbert, um, uh, DLO, um, Kendra, everybody on the academic service team because we were very strategic on how we approach that. Um, and so our building, we are investing in our building leadership teams. And so our building leadership teams, the capacity to grow them as leaders, our future leaders, is so important. We need them to create movement. And so on November 11th, we're gathering them from 8 to 9 um, to invest in them. Another group of teachers that our curriculum advisors have been supporting are new teachers. And that's the other big piece. Um, you'll see that we have 71 first year teachers. That is a lot. So first year teachers, that means they're brand new to the profession. And then we also uh, work with Desi in the support of second year teachers. Um, and so we have 45 um, teachers um, that are second year that we're supporting. Um, and our curriculum advisors um, really, um, you know, they, they uh, created a great start plan for onboarding them. And so we provided some valuable learning in August for them. But the learning doesn't just stop. We host a learning session each month. And it's based off the needs of our, um, well, what, whatever the new teachers are telling us they need, basically. Um, and so you'll see here in the plan, let's see if I can blow this up a little bit more. So this outlines the plan uh, for the year for our first year teachers um, on the screen. And so the next one is November 2nd. Um, and it's already been revised um, based off feedback uh, from our teachers. Um, our teachers say they need support um, in student management and student behaviors. And so we're having our behavior interventionists come in and lead some learning that time. Um, we also, at that new teacher learning, honor a community partnership showcase um, in which we uh, bring um, a community organization that supports our students in. And they um, speak to the piece of um, what, do, what resources do they provide for our students. Um, and so we had the junior league come in in September. And then um, United Way came in in October. And then November's is the AFL-CIO uh, with their Adopt-A-Family program. Mm -hmm. um, they provide um, a lot of support for our students and our families with the Adopt-A-Family program. Um, and um, I know back at my school when I was at Bodie, um, our team, a team of teachers and I, myself, uh, we adopted a family. Um, and so we want to show to teachers that's a, a potential for you to do, you know, um, take that back and be the catalyst for change in that. Um, so that's the support of our new teachers, and if you look at the calendar, it goes all the way until April, um, and that learning there. Um, not only do they receive learning um, through this piece, but our curriculum advisors go in and observe them once in the first semester and once in the second semester, and they provide non-evaluative feedback. It's a support piece. Um, and so um, it's pretty much based off what the new teacher says, hey, I think I'm struggling in this. I want to grow in this. And so um, they take that feedback, and they'll speak to that um, here in their work. Um, but on top of also embar uh, uh, onboarding our new teachers, we also equip new teachers with a mentor. 
that's placed in their school. And we have 111 mentors. Um, some of our mentors um, double up in the fact that they support more than just um, one new teacher. Um, so, for example, um, Teresa um, Friedman, I think, at Lafayette has multiple new teachers that she's working with. Um, and so we provide the support for our mentors, too. And the fact, you just, what, I mean, that's a relationship piece, right? You have a mentor that's sitting down with a new teacher, and then you're like, okay, so what do I talk to my new teacher about? Because typically, that teacher is a master at what they're doing. Um, and so we leave with a discussion guide, and we have a little discussion guide so that they could follow along should they need it, um, and the resources to support them in their mentorship work. Um, and then down at the bottom, um, so all you know, we did um, a lot of outpulling of learning. Like I call we bring our teachers together for professional learning, like at Engage for a day. We did the convocation a day. But our curriculum advisors are so um, embedded in the classroom, and that's where their heart lies. And so what you'll see are some examples of the plan that they're leading up. And so the examples here that you'll find are the SJSD lesson framework. <laughs> Uh, one of the areas of concern was that um, some of our new teachers um, weren't um, designers of instruction. They didn't know how to, um, it's not that they didn't know how to um, craft a lesson plan, it's just what are better practices to crafting a lesson plan. Um, and so we led with the SJSD lesson framework and it's really four simplistic things that new teachers follow. Other things are the English language arts resources. I know Dr. Lau um, speaks to our work in um, wanting and needing to improve um, literacy instruction um, uh, based off data, and so we're leading with that. And so there's a lot of support around English language arts resources. What's the standard saying? What are the ways to get to that standard? A lot of work there. And then we also partnered up with our behavior interventionist. Um, and we lead with the eight effective teaching um, and learning practices. Um, and so uh, a lot of time is spent um, looking at those eight effective practices in the observation work of our curriculum advisors. And one of the big last pieces that you'll see for the examples of the plan, which I mean is embedded in the classroom work that we are leading in the classroom with, is research-based instructional strategies that we are not using strategies that was used when I was in school um, a long time ago. They, we are so much research and so much science around what accelerates learning. Um, and um, so we're leading with those acceleration strategies um, and um, speaking to um, what can move student learning, what really is the impact of student learning. Um, you know, in our classroom work, really, it's a, it's a delicate piece because you want to recognize and acknowledge that our teachers are doing great work. Um, a part of our goal is to extend and elevate their practices, not add to their plate, but extend and elevate through a stretch or a challenge. And that's what we do. We question, we add, we read one questions, um, which causes those teachers to um, really think about, like, like, let's not forget why we do what we do and what decisions we make, right? Because it's really the student at the center of those decision making. And that's exactly what we leave with every single day, is that that student is at the decision, in the center of our decisions every single day. <coughs> Tiffany, Heather, these are, if you look down at the list, uh, these are individuals in the mid -tier. Um, and you'll see there's at the very bottom on the left hand side there. Uh, Tiffany will speak to her work. She primarily has been working at Edison um, and spending a lot of time in the classrooms at Edison and Heather has been leading the work up at Mark Twain. So I'll let these ladies chime in with anything that they would want to add to their piece. I think um, the student center uh, piece that she spoke to is kind of what we always lead with and we keep that in the forefront of our mind um, as we work with teachers. It, it's about the teachers but really it's about the students and so um, if we keep that in uh, you know at the forefront each time we go to work with anybody you know working with students is our main goal. Um, uh, having the collaboration and um, just to, to drive our student achievement is what we keep 
in the forefront. Mm -hmm. And I would piggyback off of that. Um, I love to teach kids to read, and I love to teach kids that it's valuable and that it's imperative for their life. Mm -hmm. And so my goal at Edison is to foster that, foster that with great books and encourage teachers to facilitate that. I'm so thankful for these individuals. These are the movers and shakers. These, you know, really intention is so easy, right? Intention is easy. Implementation is hard. And so they implement every single day the action plans that we create. And so if we didn't have these individuals, these plans would just sit here. A lot of times education becomes so data rich, but information poor. So you have lots and lots of data, right? But you don't know what to do with the data. These individuals know what to do with the data. I'm surrounded by the best, like I said. So <clears throat> It's good to know. Quick question. Uh, teacher support, 71 new teachers in the first year. Uh, I would assume, obviously, a lot of that teacher support is directly connected to retention um, and how well they feel supported. Can you elaborate? Mm -hmm. Very much so, David. Very much so. Um, you know, and that's why I appreciated Dr. Lau in the last two years um, with her piece because this is something that was inherited to me. Like we, it was when I was a new teacher, I had a mentor in my building, and that was it. Um, now they have an outsider's perspective, a curriculum advisor that isn't tied to the classroom that can help um, at any anything that the new teacher might need, whether it be like resources or, um, Heather, what have you worked with? Um, the, right now, um, Colin, who's, who's also in the Midtown, is not here because he's taking a group of teachers into cl other classrooms right now. And he's showing new teachers good instruction, what good instruction looks like. Those are the things, David, that are going to keep our teachers here. We invest in our people not programs. And so really, if we invest in our people, they'll stay, I pray and hope, they stay committed to the purpose of what we're trying to do. And the bigger purpose is uh, that, to improve student learning, um, but also to better our community as well. Um, and so I believe the curriculum advisor role, the mentorship role, will play a huge factor in the retention of these teachers. Um, we'll watch the number. Um, we um, will see how many teachers, um, new teachers we keep um, with the support of our, our curriculum advisors. It's been pretty, I don't know the exact number and I could go back to look, but it's been, it's been high. Um, you were just in a um, place where we have retirement right now. <laughs> um, and so lots of people are retiring and so that is causing the, I would say, um, an, an, uh, an influx of new teachers. I got a couple more questions, but uh, <laughs> I'm trying to leave the opportunity for other people, obviously, to ask questions too. But out of the 73% 70, agree uh, about you know positive feedback on convocation, 87% um, with the uh, 3D professional development. Any idea how many of those were new teachers? I don't know. Oh, um, the convocation survey results were just sent to um, okay. me. We do survey our new teachers after our new teacher learning ticket, but it's more about like, what do you need? Um, is this worthwhile, what we are doing? Um, what could we do better as a curriculum advisor team? And they're, they're pretty um, honest and great, give us good movements for um, our direction, what we should need to move to. Um, but as far as um, the convocation results, I believe Ashley just shared it was a little pie graph. And so, you know, you question, do you leave with a convocation every single year? It was a hit this year, right? But then you look at the results, and overwhelmingly everybody, I believe that question was like close to 65% said they'd like to leave with a convocation every year. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? No questions? I'm just curious to this. How many teachers do we have this year total? I don't know the exact number, Mr. Reader. I know that when we hosted the Engaged Learning, we had 1,056 participants for the Engaged Learning that day. 
And that included like our paras, our support, some of our support staff, counselors, um, things like that. So I'd have to look at HR to get that number. I think we'll I'd say it's around 900 as far as teachers. I was going to say 800. I can say 800. HR, yeah. About 1,600 total. So yeah, about probably in between 850 and 9. Well, I was wondering what the 781, which it seems that you said oh, that's a, big, yeah. it's a high number. I was kind of trying to find a percentage. Right. And so that percentage alone would make it then higher than normal, I guess. Right, right. And those who surveyed, right? Because mm -hmm. you can send out a survey lead, but who's, yeah. who takes that survey yeah. um, for that piece? But. Is it more challenging to advise a, a veteran teacher as opposed to a brand new teacher? It's not more challenging, I would say. I, I would say uh, that they provide us um, with um, questions and lenses that we might not um, have thought of. Um, and they have a perspective, and their perspective is rich um, that they bring to the team. Um, you know, it's, it is critical that we get our new teachers very early on to create excellence of habits. Like, what are these habits of excellence that we want to lead with in a district? And so lesson plan design, um, the last two years in the curriculum advisor role, I saw that was a need. Uh, we did not lead as a district a framework for like how you design lessons. And not that I want teachers to turn in a lesson plan every single day, but what are the critical components of a lesson design? You start with a warm up, you have a little mini lesson, you lead with independent practice, and you close out a reflection piece. And if they lead with those four pieces, behavior management <laughs> issues will go down, right? Because kids tend to thrive when you have routines and structures and procedures in place. If you have none, and you talk to a new teacher and you're like, what are you leading with? What's your structure of your classroom design look like? They don't know. And so we had to provide them with something. Mm -hmm. And so the first lift had to be, and Dr. Gilpin laughs because we lift lots of things, but um, the first lift had to be the lesson plan framework design. Mm -hmm. If we were going to get a control on, is it, the, is, it, is, it, is it trauma, is it the behaviors of that, or is it just a lack of tier one sound instructional practices? And so um, that lesson plan framework from when we discussed and reflected has been critical um, in onboarding new teachers with, as a district, we lead with this. This is our habit. <laughs> and so as a principal, when you come into the classroom, we, we, have, we have a common language of what we lead with. So to answer so, your question, David, it's not, it's not as challenging. It's just a different um, perspective. So, mm -hmm. I think you touched on it a little bit, but um, as far as maybe surveys. Yes. Uh, but how do you how do you monitor the success of a uh, curriculum advisor? Mm. That's great. You know, um, as a, when I was in the role, I monitored the um, success through student achievement numbers. So how how was was my work impactful? So like last year, we were working with middle school ELA. Um, and we were um, working with digital publications in the Read 180 program, and we were trying to watch um, middle school data um, through the iReady, um, but also get some, I, I have some pretty tough teacher friends that like to keep me real, um, and so they provide that qualitative feedback for me too. Okay. Any other questions, comments? I think that's a really good question was, um, how do we see if the curriculum advisors are being effective? And how long has this been in place? Mm, I don't know. I came two years ago um, in the curriculum advisor role. We used to have um, an instructional coach for each and every building. Mm -hmm. um, and I served as an instructional coach um, at that particular time. Um, I want to say it's been five years, maybe, the mm -hmm. curriculum advisor role. And that's just an, um, a really an educated kind of lens of thinking right now, Ms. Garcia. But I can get you that. Um, I know they expanded the team um, because we are, if you'll find, um, strategically placed in schools and working with um, our schools that really need our support and the resources um, to support the movement. Um, uh, student learning, um, but um, 
man, I wish we could have one for every building. That would be wonderful. And that's been our goal is really to say, now that we have a strategic focus, um, because they're placed in territories, are we really impactful in our work? Okay. And how many do we have? There's 11. 11. Mm -hmm. So they're based um, solely in our Title I schools? They're not in our Title I schools. Oh, they're not. Um, no, they can work with any, they have a certain territory. So like um, these individuals work with Central, Truman, Bodie, Ellison, Parkway, Edison, and Mark Twain. Okay. So they have a midtown, kind of a, schools that are centrally located, almost feed into Central. Um, uh, we, when we sat down and devised the territories, we looked at the number of staff that these individuals would have to um, help and support. And we also looked at the number of students. How many students were they going to be in? in and when you get to that Midtown, there's a lot of students at Central and Bodie and Truman. Um, and so this, there's a smaller number of elementaries um, in that piece. Um, and so we moved like Carden Park and Skate to the South Side to um, accommodate um, the number of staff and the number of students that would be they would be servicing in that territory. And I'm sure they could tell you, and I did it too, is um, that sometimes you really want deep learning in order to have deep learning and not surface level. Like, I'm just going to go to school, I'm going to check in with some teachers, and then I'm going to leave. Um, really, the, the um, reorganization of the curriculum advisor team has allowed um, them to have deeper learning impact in the classroom. Um, and Heather, you could probably speak to your work at Mark Twain more than... Yeah, I spend a lot of time there with teachers and building relationships, look at data, which kids need, what, what do the kids need, what do the kids mm -hmm. need, that's always the question. And so uh, we plan a lot um, using the lesson design, um, and so I'm in classrooms a lot working with um, Mrs. Evans, who's the principal there, mm -hmm. a lot um, to plan instruction. <coughs> Actually, right now I'm headed back to uh, learning <laughs> instructional rounds that are going on right now. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I spent I, I spend a lot of time there. Although I we have we're in charge of many buildings, um, we try to focus um, on using the data what the students need in our district. So. Okay. And how long do you say? Uh, how long would a usual visit take? Do you know how long you spend at one school mm -hmm. usually? She's there all day. All day. Pretty yeah. much. Okay. Yeah. 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 So do you have a schedule as in, I'm going to go to this school on this day, this yeah. school on the other day? Okay. Yeah. So we, we try to, within our team, um, when principals ask for specific things or teachers ask for specific things, um, we have a shared calendar so we can make sure everybody um, everybody's needs are met. Um, and if someone can't, someone else can, or we try to make it work. Um, that way, but but I I speaking for myself, I focus a lot of time on Mark Twain right now. Yeah. And so is that just the school that's catching your attention data wise? Is that why you're spending a lot of time there? Um, it's it's that, and um, there's some new instructors there that need some additional support, and um, some teachers in new grade levels, that kind of thing. So it's so it's not focused on one thing. It's 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 a plethora of. of the things that we take into consideration when we're spreading our time out, but yeah. Okay. And um, Dr. Eckert, did you say that we have um, 1,600 teachers in total? No. no. We have 1,600 staff members in total. We have about 800, 850 to 900 teachers. Okay. And how many of those are new? How many of the teachers that are new? Mm -hmm. 70. 71. Mm -hmm. 71. 71 first year teachers. Okay. We have 45 second year teachers. Mm -hmm. 45 second year teachers. <coughs> oh, I'm sorry. Just to see if you're no, I did get one. I'm oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Give us a question when you're talking about, um, you know, one of the basics is to uh, lesson planning and, and having teachers, especially new ones. Do you do any collaboration or talking to like Missouri Western and Northwest? Hmm. You know, it's part of when they're getting their degrees, that that would be something that they would focus on? Mm -hmm. Yes, very much so. Um, you know, and Missouri Western um, leads them through the Madeline Hunter um, uh, lesson plan design, and 
Um, that is um, a nice format um, if you're planning a unit of instruction, but um, we wanted to, um, and I'm working with Dr. Botello, um, and she's the um, literacy um, instructor at Missouri Western. How can um, we um, marry our practices together, um, and how can we um, prepare our new teachers um, for the classroom? Some of our new teachers, though, are um, currently first year um, mm -hmm. teacher, but also going through um, student teaching. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh huh. Um, and so we have some of our <laughs> new teachers that are also um, experiencing oh. that. Um, piece as well. So, uh, you know, when I was a student teacher, I student taught over at Bodhi and I had a mentor and um, she watched my practice and gave me feedback on spots. Um, and um, that was a nice piece, right? But um, because of the um, shortage of teachers and demands of, um, of asking um, individuals to step in roles, that's why it, this, is, this role is so imperative right now. Um, because we have to have our new teachers that are also doing student experience have that in the moment feedback mm -hmm. and these individuals will leave that up with them. It seems like it seems like a very crucial role in the district. Uh, I would personally I would just like to see um, probably more information on it maybe on a more ongoing uh, mm -hmm. basis. You know what Mr. Foster I'd love for you to come shadow us. Like, I would love for you to come see the work that we do um, and get a feel for um, that piece and what they lead with every single day. It's always a new adventure mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, that you are, sometimes you're just caught off guard. You don't know if this is the need right now. Um, but that would be, um, yeah, I would be more than happy to share um, mm -hmm. more information with you. And, and the, like I said, this is just all in the first quarter. These are all what they accomplished in the first quarter. Um, Who would we contact if we wanted to come to do like a shadow in like a couple of hours? Yes. Any of us? Yes. I contact would. over to you or to. Yeah. Why don't you get a hold of me and then we mm -hmm. can. Um, yes, that would be great. Thank you. You're welcome. Would you tell us just a little bit more? You mentioned focusing on reading. Mm -hmm. so. Could you tell us? Um, so we do a lot of lesson planning, and right now ELA is new. The uh, framework has been changed, the curriculum has been changed, and so our focus is to get kids into books and to read independently, to read on grade level, to um, just be exposed to rich text, um, and everything is centered around any kind of text, whether it's math, science, social studies, language arts. Um, I'm working with several teachers at Edison and we're working on novels and reading through a novel and putting in some of those um, instructional strategies that accompany um, rich text and a lot of it's based off of Desi's recommendations and things of that nature. So are you more focused on ELA learners or? Um, I focus on what teachers ask for for help. Right now, because the ELA is new, it is a shift, and mm -hmm. so that's what they've been asking for help more with. Um, but if a teacher needs help with math or science or mm -hmm. business or, well, maybe not business. I need to correct you. kind of has a gift or a lens that they lead with, and so like Heather is our K-3, experts, um, really, Tiffany is an upper elementary, and then Colin, um, who's not here in this midtown, he's our middle and high school. And Colin's gift is in math, um, and so he provides that well-rounded uh, team perspective. And so when we looked at the team structure and who we placed individuals with in that territory, there's, there's a math individual, a literacy specialist, and then an early um, literacy um, a guru, too. So you can definitely see the power of collaboration in our team because we really play off of each other's strengths. Mm -hmm. It takes it takes collaboration between the three of us. So that's nice. You know, Reba, and we've had like I've called our district has had a tool surplus but a strategies deficit. And so we have been sharing all these great tools online with teachers and every new innovation piece that's come mm -hmm. out. What we're trying to do is the how right now. 
So how are you teaching this? How are you using this tool? What, how is the structure of your classroom look like? Yeah. It's a strategy um, piece that we're leading with. Now, part of that was caused by the pandemic mm -hmm. um, because everything moved online pretty quickly. And uh, then you're like, okay, no, we, not that we need, want to go back, but there is some uh, research behind having a text in your hand. There is research with writing um, it out. There's research with doing close reading strategies. Mm -hmm. And so making sure that those pieces come back. Um, that, you know, kids chose to be in person now. And so let's get them connected with each other. Let's get them connected with you and the teacher again. And let's get them connected with one another. So, so that that's the kind of that shift in that literacy world is that mm -hmm. we're working with right now is like the model of the small group rotations and the teacher driving a lesson, but also personalizing the lesson to meet the needs of the child, and also having the independent reading practice come back. Kids have books in their hands. Books in their hands. Okay. We do appreciate everything you both do in this room. Uh, there are no other questions or comment, and thank you for coming to present. Uh, we'll move on to item two, M66 data, Dr. Kendra Lau. Okay, I'm gonna have to connect my computer, so. You need me to do that for you? Yes, <laughs> please do. <laughs> okay. In the meantime, I'm gonna pass some things around as, that we'll be talking about. that then well we can look at some things online but in the meantime um what i was asked to do in this particular meeting is to go over and if, you share it, I don't have anything to off of. and if anybody has an extra one of the and i apologize because i don't have extra oh i have one that's great um so what I was asked to do is go over some M66 information, and um, I know that not everyone in this room has been involved uh, at the same level of M66 as some others of you are. Um, we've been having a monthly meetings since June um, with board members and a lot of folks in this room uh, surrounding the implications for M66. So, but for some of you, this is new information. So I wanted to take time a little bit today and back up and then we can go forward. But really what this is all about is Missouri School um, Improvement Program. And this is like their sixth iteration of the kind of the guidelines that Missouri uh, gives us through the lens of the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. So um, this is where we get our accreditation, and this is where we get things like our annual performance report, uh, both at a district level and at a school level. And so um, there was a pretty big shift this, this year with M66 in that it used to be just solely uh, focused on performance results of students. And that's how districts would get their accreditation. And that's what would show up on their annual performance report. So things like test scores, things like attendance, things like graduation rate, um, all of those particular components, college and career readiness. Uh, and so that's really all that, that um, 
we were measured by for those academic results. And so what the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education did was add a different and, and unique component to it this year. And that is through the lens of continuous improvement. And so 70% of our accreditation will still come from our academic results. And again, those are those test scores, those are graduation rate, attendance rate, college career readiness. Um, and there's been a little bit of change even on that side of the equation, so to speak. But then over here is this, we'll get 30% of our points will come from our continuous improvement. And how is that going to be measured? Well, the way that it will be measured is that we will be submitting a, com a continuous school improvement plan to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. And in addition to that, we'll be also submitting what they call response to standards. And um, then we'll get a score on that. And that score is, um, like I said, 30% of our accreditation. And so it's an important component. So um, in light of that, that's kind of the broad overview. And so for some of you guys, it's the same song, second verse. For some of you, this is new information. So I wanted to pause there and see if anybody had any questions, kind of on like a broad overview. Okay. So, um, so what I was going to do is then kind of take you into this document, this Word document that everyone has. And that is page one of our school district's um, continuous improvement a strategic plan and so really um, what the process was is we had a we, we had a CSIP that's what they're lovingly called across the state um, and so and most school districts do so th this wasn't a big shock except for the fact that Desi has very specific standards um, and and so they want those specific standards to be visible in your current CSIP. Uh, and in addition to that, as all of you know, we have a vision forward, um, you know, that's been going on and, and collecting feedback from the community. So there was a, several different, if you will, um, let me use this metaphor, se several different um, legs to the stool when it came to creating and synthesizing um, our CSIP that we will submit to the state. Uh, so really what we did was take what was existing and then look through the lens of the you know 118-page and SIP-6 document and look at community feedback and try to begin to synthesize this particular plan. And by the way, this is not something that is, you know, um, in stone in terms of it, it can't be a living, breathing document. So as the school district continues to gather feedback, as it continues to make plans, as it continues to look at strategies, this is also very malleable and can work within those things as well. Um, and can be part of a larger, long-term, long-planning strategic um, document as well. Because it, it, in it, on its face, has within the, in the document, if we were really to get, dig into it, it has action plans. And part of those action plans, some of those are short-term and some of those are long-term. So some of those longer range, um, you know, uh, goals that the St. Joe School District would have would fit within that component of the plan. And so, um, and, and so if you take a second to look through this, um, really the, the first um, goal that, that is laid out is about leadership. And that, was a, that is a big deal to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, and it's a big deal to our particular school district. Because what they wanted to ensure was that boards of education were um, able to uh, 
really monitor the academic preparation and well-being of kids in the school district. And so that that would be at the forefront of discussions. And whether that's through the data lens or whether it's through learning about curriculum advisors or whether it's learning about what's going on in our ESOL program or early childhood, that those would be things that boards of education were clear about and also that they had data to better understand it as well. And so a lot of times we talk about, we have a lot of how, like, like Stacia um, talked about the how of the curriculum advisors. What's the process to help support teachers? That's the how. Well, and then you have to ask the question, how do you know it works, right? And so that's where things like that fit within this plan, that's where data reviews will come in. So we will have data reviews at the middle of the year and Stacia and her team will put together data that show whether or not the impact is or is not happening where there is a concentration of curriculum advisors. That's just a responsible thing to do. So those kind of pieces um, are what really from a leader, visionary leadership really means do we have the structures in place in the St. Joe School District that allow for continuous improvement to take place? And so that is um, where we're leading with this. Because again, if you continue to unpack this, and some of us have been involved in the unpacking of it, there, is, there are plans and strategies at every level that allow for that visionary leadership to um, have, really, to, to have visibility into whether or not the things we're doing are effective and are working. The uh, second goal, each student is being prepared to be success ready every day in the St. Joseph School District. So um, last meeting that we had with our MSIP 6 um, committee meeting, we looked at several scorecards. And so we looked at one of the scorecards you have in front of you, and we looked at our success ready index. And so again, we, show, we are showing the Board of Education this is how we know. And so we looked at those particular pieces. Um, and we have a, also have a social and emotional <coughs> index, and we'll be looking at that. Um, and how do we know we are taking care of the well-being of our kids? Or are we not? Are we, or are we not? And what do we, what do, we do about that? Um, so that's, those are other pieces that we'll be looking at under goal two. So you can tell that the how and the how do you know go quite well together in this plan. Um, we have ways to, to talk to you about that. Um, the SJSD is a happy place to learn and work. So we need it to be happy for our kids, positive learning environment, and we need a positive culture for our staff. Um, those are important pieces. And so you've got several different um, bullet items under that particular goal that we will be monitoring whether or not that is happening with all the processes in place that we have from taking care of our new teachers to um, ensuring that we have a positive learning environment. And we've talked about that in some of our uh, uh, MSIP 6 meetings. And then four is regardless of background, all students are success ready. So that goes into one of uh, a key indicator under M6, M6, which is equity and access. And so uh, if you look at goal two, and then you look at goal four, goal four is just going to be monitoring the gap between different subsets of our students. So we will be looking at what kind of gap exists and how do we close those gaps. So that is really, that, this is really just page one of a multi-page plan um, that has already been submitted to DESE twice. And so um, both times uh, the, the reviews have been very positive from our regional director. Um, this last time, it, it was just last week, um, we look like we're perfectly on target for what it is they're asking us to do. 
Now we are working on, as a team, our response to standards. And that's where we get to shine as a district. So th this plan, I mean, we've covered our basic requirements. I mean, we've hit our indicators. Those are things that all schools and districts should be doing. And boards should be able to have information about. But what are we doing as a district that makes us jump off the page? Because that's what's going to earn us an additional, um, additional points under con the continuous improvement umbrella. And potentially could also earn us ex um, being exemplary across the district. Mm -hmm. And that's what we would like to see happen. So that's where we're working on really underneath the standards that DESE is asking us to respond to. That's why it's called respond to standards. There's very specific standards. They want to know how the heck do you do that? Um, and what are you doing so well in your district? And so that's what we're working on now so that we have that ready to go by December 5th, which is really a fake deadline. But um, it's really December 15th, but I said it. I know, you guys are gonna be mad at me. But then, but then, but then we're ready to go. <laughs> but then we're ready to go on time. So um, I will not, uh, you know, drag you through the, all of this entire plan. We'll save that for the MSIP 6 board uh, committee meetings that we've been having. But, um, but if you do have questions about that, and you know, I'm happy to answer those. But essentially, what's what's in the plan is action plans, like how you're going to get it done, and then how do you know you're getting it done? So um, that's that component. So then the other document that you have is this um, particular document, and for those of you that have been going to the uh, M6 board. Um, committee meetings on MSIP 6, we took a whole session just to learn how we put this, this guy together. So you may not exactly understand the nuts and the bolts of everything, you'll just have to, you know, kind of uh, believe what we're telling you, but the board does have an, a keen awareness as to how this uh, particular scorecard is put together. We call it a balanced scorecard simply because it should it is kind of like a scale for this. So here's your plan, here's all your house. We just do all this stuff. We just do all this stuff lovely. But then this actually is where you know whether you're doing it lovely or not, if that makes sense. And I'm gonna hurry up because we're we're running out of time. So um, basically um, we look at the scorecard three times a year. Some of the data is you're going to see new data three times a year, and some of it you will just see one time a year. That it's an annual marker, um, and we try to pull out the most important components for you to review. The only reason I brought uh, this today because we went over this, gosh, less than a couple weeks ago. But there are some new metrics on there, so um, I thought it would be worthwhile because we received our student Gallup poll back which lets us know how engaged our kids are, how hopeful our kids are, how much they feel like they belong, and their social and emotional learning. And so we can look at that broadly, and then there's certain questions under each one of those four categories that lets us dig a little bit deeper into those particular components. So since we're short on time, I know all of you can read. And so I'm going to just, you know, you have the metrics before you, and we'll dig into this again in our board and SIP 6 committee meetings. But again, just bringing this awareness to the academic services um, team lets you know um, that, you know, of this balanced scorecard, we own, academic services owns a big chunk of it, but finances owns a chunk of it and uh, our employee um, engagement owns a, a chunk of it and so does our climate and culture owns a chunk of it. Because we can chase academics all day long, but if your finances aren't where they need to be, if your climate's not where it is, should be, and you don't have engaged, highly qualified employees, it makes chasing academics a lot more difficult. 
So that's really why we have a, why it's called balance scorecard. So that's of that there is six minutes if anyone would like to ask any questions. And I'm sorry I couldn't get my computer up and running, but that's going to work out just fine. Well, thank you, Kendra. I um, asked her to put it on this agenda or to present this because I think it's important for the community members to know this information. I think um, the community members need to be aware that we are looking deeply into how we're doing academically. And I know um, a few people have asked if I could do, or if I could have requested to do a each school metric of what is the school doing, what is the school. It kind of becomes a little difficult because the way that the scorecard is put together is in comparison to other districts. So it's not necessarily we're pulling data from the whole district and then this is the numbers. Is we're comparing them to other districts and then that's how we get the numbers. But we will um, hopefully work on something to clarify where we're doing district-wise each school so we know um, which schools are suffering more and which ones we need to focus on. So Yeah, and really that goes to goal number four. So if you look at goal number four, it talks about um, an access and opportunity index. Mm -hmm. So that index will be parsed out per school. And so based on the categories in the access and opportunity index, we will be able to see which schools are, um, you know, they'll, they'll each have a different score through that lens. And it will incorporate um, several different components, so we'll be going over that. But I'm working with Dr. Justin Mallett at, at uh, Northwest on that particular piece. He's their Vice President of Diversity and Equity. And so we'll, we'll be putting that together through that lens. So you'll be able to see that's almost going to be like a building scorecard. Right. That will add up to a district score. Yeah. And we will be able to share that yeah. with yep. the academics committee. Also, I was wondering, um, once we get the number of what the gap looks like with the students who have a different background, if we could also talk about that. Yep. Because I think nationwide, there's a really big gap between um, kids who are in the ESOL program and kids who are not, test mm -hmm. score wise. So mm -hmm. if we can talk about that and see what we could do to you know, maybe improve on that. Absolutely, and the, and the national um, tests that were just released showed how much the pandemic exacerbated that gap. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, we won't be alone in trying to continue to close that, because the progress that was made, a lot of it was lost, and so then starting again. <coughs> So yeah, we'll be able to look at that through the success rating index. And we actually, you know, about I, middle of the year. I would be excited <coughs> to to report that we actually have a building um, that our ESOL population, our minority population, is helping our test scores. Yep. Yeah. We do true. have that. So yes, we I mean, do. Um, yeah. They're outperforming the. And I saw that yesterday because I was looking at gaps across buildings. Yeah. So some, some it's flip flop. Yeah. It's, it's vital to our customers because um, I think a little over 11 or some percentage of our um, kids in the early learning center are Spanish speaking or from a different language. So we can really focus on getting their test scores up. It would help us drastically. That's a good point. Great. Can you answer your question? We have 799 teachers. 799. Oh, then uh, the teachers, 71 new ones, what's less than 10% or so. Mm -hmm. So that's considered high, though? We usually don't have that much of a turnover? Uh, in the last two years, I've been serving as a curriculum advisor. That's the highest number that we have been servicing. But that, yeah, that's brand new. Brand year, first year. Year one, never taught a lick. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's high for a normal? It is. Okay. Mm -hmm. It is. We, we did. Oh no. Yeah, like your whole, your whole yeah. teaching staff. It's, well, it's you know that's nine and a half percent. It's probably mm -hmm. eight and a half percent. I mean, it's not up. It's not like it went from four and a half right. to ten. Yeah. It's not. But that's a lot of new folks that have never right. taught at all. Do you have a question? Yeah. Do we do access interviews? Like we do. And one thing we are going to do <laughs> is we're going to. Um, magnify those a little bit they've been kind of hid and so we've had those conversations with human resources and we're going to make those more accessible uh, right now we that we do the exit interviews dr. Krause just reports it out uh, through the uh, 
through his update uh, to the board, but we're going to make it more public as we go. I just wonder it's if, important. if we could trend yeah, why? and mm -hmm. take care of why they're failing, that yeah. would be helpful. And on this, um, when I, what I was really wanting to see is at, this is just what, third and seventh grade, does the district do their own assessment or we rely completely on this? Um, this isn't just third and, and we do our own, it's called iReady. And so I can kind of show you on the scorecard after the meeting if you'd like. It's sure. not, we, we, we pull out certain grades to look at because they're okay. certain. Okay. But it but if you look a little more closely, you'll see it's that it, it, it also is looking at all of the K-8 kids. I was just thinking if we knew at what grade level mm -hmm. They become, they're not proficient in reading order. Third grade, we start to see a little uptick in three grade levels or below, and that's on our um, success ready index, and that we showed the board last month, but that's where we start to see it. Mm -hmm. And third grade's been tough, rougher this year because these are, the were in kindergarten when the pandemic um, happened last spring. Quick uh, question. So a lot of these uh, measurements, as far as adults at this school care about me. Yes, sir. Um, good place to work. Uh, this school is a good place for me. Mm -hmm. uh, seems to be wrapped around, I guess, emotional stability. Belonging. Belonging. Yeah. How much of that was in MSIP uh, 5? Um, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, that's, that's pretty much it. How, how new is this uh, emotional stability or belonging aspect of our comprehensive plan? I think it's, it is new um, because, for example, I was um, met with one of the um, folks at DESE that presented the social and emotional learning. Um, she used to actually work at our district, Darby Valenti. Um, and this, this is a new component to MSIP 6 in that the, the idea of, of social emotional learning has been there, but not necessarily how we monitor it. And so that's the piece that's, that's new. We've been giving the Gallup survey for a while in our district, but after the pandemic, they added the social and emotional piece yeah. because of the impact that that had on a lot of kids. So now we have more capability of having visibility at, into whether or not the approaches that we're taking are, are, are helping our kids. But the belonging piece is really important too because that goes to access and opportunity. Is this, this is a good school for me. If kids don't feel like they're belonging, then, then what does that mean about the climate and culture that that school's creating for all the kids um, that are there? So if some feel like they belong and others don't, what are we doing about that? So that's helping us have visibility um, into that as well. So we can look at that per school. So Kendra, I'm going to follow up. So do you ask a follow-up question when you see that only half the kids feel like it's a good place for them? Do you, is there any follow-up? The buildings can do that so they can dig deeper into it. Yeah. Okay. And because they develop strategies off of these results. It's kind of sad that 38% are hopeful. Yes. And I worked with eighth graders at Hillier Tech for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that that was my observation. Most students left me nothing more than hope. And if we can, you know, show them opportunities exist and education will open doors. And I, I feel that's key. And it's sad to see it so low. Well, well uh, and and I I'll point taken, but that is an uptick since the pandemic. So we saw a two percent increase in the hope of our kids across the district, and a three percent in terms of engagement. So it's turning in the right direction. And by the way, that's not far off the national um, percentage. Still not good. Enough. I think uh, I agree with you, but I think we can. I'm not. I'm not arguing that it's good enough. I'm just giving you context. I think um, since it's kind of running late, but if anybody has any questions, feel free to write them down and send them to me, or at the next academic meeting, we can go ahead and go through it and 
I think Kendra will be available hopefully for the next one too. Yeah. And Ms. Garcia is the chair of the academics. That was the, the stand-in for today. Well, I was a little late. My car was giving me trouble. <laughs> but uh, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's nice to meet you.